In our Bible reading today, we'll do a little bit of the work for you. We have a Bible reading plan for our church, and today's reading is John chapter 20, and that's what we're going to read today and focus on in our message. Those of you who don't have a Bible reading plan, they're available on tables outside, and I encourage you to follow the one that our church is following or one of your own devising, because to continue to read and take in God's Word is a way of getting to know Him better um, to love him more faithfully. So encourage you again to um, renew your Bible reading, your listening to God's voice. Today we're going to read from John chapter 20. We'll begin with the last few verses of John 19. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, that is John, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. And he saw... And believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting there where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced this to the disciples. I've seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the marks of the nails and place my hand in his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. 
Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This ends the reading of God's word, and God always blesses his word to those who listen. Thomas is known to history as Doubting Thomas. And having heard the story, you know why. He doubted, he refused to believe when he was told that Christ had risen from the dead. And so he's always known by that title, Doubting Thomas. But I want to reflect today with you even more so on trusting Thomas. Thomas, the man of faith. Thomas, the man who makes the greatest confession of faith in Jesus that is made by any disciple, my Lord and my God. That is the highest confession of faith that can be made. And that's the confession of faith that is made right before John tells the whole reason he wrote the book. He brings his whole book to its high point, to its main point, with those words of Thomas, my Lord and my God. And then he says, now I wrote these things so that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you would have life in his name. If you leave this place with the faith of Thomas, if you're like trusting Thomas, you're in a very, very good position. But first, of course, we do have to pay a little bit of attention to doubting Thomas. And the Bible doesn't tell us a great deal about Thomas, but what it does fits the classic profile of a doubter. Thomas was a pessimist. He was a questioner, a loner, and a skeptic. He was a pessimist. And a pessimist is somebody who looks at life and sees the grimmer realities, the dark side, the things that trouble you. If you um, look at Thomas, you see him ready to go with Jesus. Jesus says, now let's go back to Judea. And the disciples say to him, but Lord, last time we were in Judea, not long ago, they tried to kill you. They threw rocks at you and wanted to stone you. And Thomas called the twins, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. <laughs> He's ready to follow Jesus, and yeah, we're going to die with him, but I think I'll go anyway. Now, some of you who read children's books will recognize uh, that personality type a little bit. Um, you know, Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh is the sort of character who, if you say, good morning, he says, if it is a good morning, which I doubt... Uh, they're funny things, accidents. You never have them till you're having them. Uh, it's my birthday. What are birthdays? Here today and gone tomorrow. When something strange happens that can't be explained, the sky has fallen. Always knew it would. <laughs> or if you're not a Winnie the Pooh fan, maybe you like um, the Chronicles of Narnia and... Puddle Glum in the silver chair is one of those guys who's a pessimist. Um, somebody comes up to him and wants to tell him something. He says, what is it? Is the king dead? Has an enemy landed in Narnia? Is it a flood or a dragon? Good morning, guests. Though when I say good, I don't mean it probably won't turn to rain or it might snow or fog or thunder. You didn't get any sleep, I dare say. Uh, very likely, what with enemies, mountains, rivers to cross, losing our way, next to nothing to eat and sore feet, we'll hardly notice the weather. You know, the good thing is, um, if we break our necks going down the cliff, at least we won't drown in the river. <laughs> I'm on Aslan's side, even if there isn't any Aslan. You know, he, he doubts, he's not even sure there is, but hey, why not be on his side anyway? He's... One of these pessimists who looks at life pretty grimly. So whether, uh, whether you've got a big dose of Eeyore in you or of Puddle Glum, that's what a 
pessimist is like. And some of us, let's face it, are just wired that way. And it's not always a bad thing, but it's certainly not always a good thing either. It makes life just a little more difficult for you and sometimes for the people around you. If you're gloomy a great deal of the time and for every silver lining you get to see the cloud. Thomas was also a questioner. Jesus said to his disciples, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Well, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But Thomas is the one who doesn't quite get it. And if he doesn't get it, he's not going to pretend that he knows what's up. He's going to ask. He's going to say, Lord, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. You think you could fill me in on this? He's a questioner. And people who uh, have doubts, who struggle with doubt, are more likely to be questioners. There's some people who just don't doubt very easily and they don't ask many questions and sometimes they don't actually know what's going on either, but um, they kind of feel like, well, whatever that guy's saying, I'm sure it's right and I'm not going to question it. And so they don't ask, but Thomas was a questioner. He also was a loner. Thomas called the twin was not with them when Jesus came. When something tough happens, when life is hard, some people deal with it, first of all, by withdrawing. You want to be by yourself. You don't like being with people that much anyway, but especially when you're not feeling up to it. When life has dealt you major blows, you do not want to hang out with other people. You're going to deal with it by yourself, alone. And sometimes people even who are going through a downtime or a spiritually downtime will try to handle it that way too. They don't want to be with others. And the farther they feel from God or the more um, despairing they are about how their life is going, the more into their shell they draw. They don't want to go to church because then they're going to have to be with other people. Ew. You know, some of us just are more introverted and we deal with hard times by sticking to ourselves. The downside of that, of course, is sometimes when you choose not to show up for church, Jesus does show up. And you missed something really, really big. That happened to Thomas. He was off by himself when Jesus came to the meeting of the disciples. Sometimes that can still happen today. I know some people where, you know, they wonder why the Lord hasn't given them a word or hasn't helped them and they may be off on their own. What if the Lord had a message for them that Sunday and it was spoken and they weren't there to hear it? What if the Lord had somebody waiting to give them a smile and a hug and a word of encouragement, but they weren't there to receive it? That's the downside of being a loner. Sometimes there is a word that God has in store for you or uh, a touch from the Lord that he has waiting for you, but you might want to show up to receive that word and that touch. But Thomas was off by himself when the Lord came to the disciples. And then a skeptic, unless I see, seeing, is believing. I'm not going to believe based on your hearsay. Sure, I know I've hung out with you for three years and you're telling me something and you claim it's true, but I don't believe it. I don't buy into what other people tell me. I either see for myself or I don't believe it at all. Unless I see, oh, but, but seeing isn't even believing. You might be hallucinating. You might be having vision problems. I want to touch i got to see, and then I've got to touch the mark of the nails and place my finger in the marks and put my hand in his side, and then, yeah, then I'll believe. Show me. Let me touch it. Otherwise, it just isn't real. The only real things are what can be seen and touched, and even it's not enough 
that they're real enough to be seen and touched. I've got to see it for myself. I've got to touch it for myself. Because I'm, I'm kind of the measure of what reality is. That, that also can be something that infects skeptics in every age. Uh, reality and truth is determined by what I have experienced lately and by what I've decided is the fact of the matter. So, uh, Thomas earns his title, Doubting Thomas, and some of the things that we hear about him in the Bible add up to a classic doubter. These things did Thomas count as real? The warmth of blood, the chill of steel, the grain of wood, the heft of stone, the last frail twitch of blood and bone. The vision of his skeptic mind was keen enough to make him blind to any unexpected act too large for his small world of fact. His reasoned certainties denied that one could live when one had died until his fingers read like braille the markings of the spear and nail. May we, O God, by grace believe and thus the risen Christ receive whose raw imprinted palms reached out and beckoned Thomas from his doubt. The pessimist, the questioner, the loner, the skeptic, doubting Thomas, and yet trusting Thomas, because Jesus did come to Thomas. And that is a great part of the good news. No matter how you're wired, even if you're one of those who seems a very unlikely candidate for believing, Jesus has his ways. And Jesus has his ways of reaching people of different kinds, even the most hardened doubters. And that is one more great uh, reason for confidence in the resurrection, the different kinds of witnesses that were there. A Matthew, you know, that accountant, that tax guy. Uh, you've got, a, a, you've got a, a zealot who's a religious revolutionary, Simon the Zealot's in the room. You've got Peter and James. Uh, you've got a woman who can't hardly um, get over her own heartbreak that Jesus comes and says, Mary, and she believes. And then you've got Thomas, who is very, very skeptical, and yet Jesus wins him over to faith. My Lord and my God. Now, when Jesus comes into that room, it turns out that he had been in the room even when they hadn't seen him in the room. Because, what does he say to Thomas Ryder? Okay, you want to see my hands? You want to see my side? You want to touch them? Have at it. Now, what's that mean? It means Jesus already heard what Thomas said. When Thomas was saying, I'll never believe unless... I've got to see. I've got to touch. I've got to do this. Uh, while you're saying all those I've got is and voicing your doubts and venting, somebody's listening to you. He heard it all. He heard it all. We might want to keep that in mind too when, you know, when we think we're stewing by ourselves and having our own big ideas. You're never alone. You are in the presence of the living one and the presence of his spirit, even if he's not there physically in the body where you can see and touch him. That might cause us to be just a little bit more reverent when we're trumpeting our doubts and our great rationality, that we are in his presence, and he's hearing us and knowing our words and our thoughts, even when we're not acknowledging him. They're, they're just a little memo. When you don't know Jesus very well, he knows you really well. At any rate, he comes to Thomas, and he says, you wanted it, you got it. And Thomas, whether he ever actually touches or not, the Bible doesn't say uh, when he sees Jesus, he just says, my Lord and my God. He makes a personal confession that Jesus is his Lord and his God. And, of course, he's making that great theological confession that Jesus is the Lord, the one who reigns over all things, and that he is God, one with the Father, one of the Holy Spirit, he makes that great confession about God and about his relationship to Jesus as God. And that's why I say we also want to pay a lot of attention, not just to doubting Thomas, though I think it may help for some of you who would say, well, Thomas was called the twin, and I think I am his twin. Um, I am a, a skeptic. I am a loner. I am somebody who has lots of questions. You know, a lot of us maybe would be twins to Thomas, and it's encouraging that if you are one of Thomas's twins, God doesn't give up on you. But it's also helpful to know that 
God made Thomas into something, that the risen Christ brought him to this great and living and powerful faith. And when the Lord gets hold of you, he doesn't just wipe out your personality and start with a blank slate. He'll wipe out your sins and not hold them against you, but he still works with who you are. And sometimes who you are can be used in mighty ways. You shouldn't just say, oh, I wish I wasn't an introvert. I, I wish that I wasn't somebody who asked questions. Don't spend your life wishing that you had a totally different personality and that you were wired a totally different way. A pessimist has, you know, certain challenges if you're always looking at the dark side, but there is also the positive side. When you're a pessimist, you deal with reality, not just with wishful thinking or with seeing things you way, the way you want them to be. You're, you're a realist, and a converted pessimist can be somebody who is ready to go into some challenging situations, whereas sometimes you have other people who just kind of believe because, hey, um, it seems like a cheery thing to believe. It might not be true, but it makes me feel pretty good. Uh, you know, this is more of a, a tough, clear-eyed faith when you're a pessimist and you come to faith. When you're a person who asks questions, you're not just going by what vibe you have. You're thinking. You're using this thing on top of your shoulders. And that's not a bad thing. To be somebody who thinks, and when you don't understand, you ask a question, and then another question. There's tremendous value, because sometimes when you ask questions, you get answers. And the Lord answers them, and then you're able to help other people who are still asking questions. You'll notice, too, that being a loner has its downside, especially if you're just too isolated from other people. But being a loner also has its upside. Your faith, if you have faith, is personal. You trust in Jesus because you trust in Jesus, not just because mom and dad, grandpa and grandma, or 14 of your buddies did. You believe in Jesus. You say, my Lord, my God. And that same person who sometimes has a downside of being a loner and isn't with God's people when you ought to be, when you're fired by the Lord and you know there is in Christ and you still have a little bit of that loner mentality, you can stand against the world. When God calls you to do something, you can do it even if you're not accompanied by a crowd. Thomas heard Jesus' call. He confessed Jesus, my Lord and my God. And according to church history, Thomas went to India as a missionary where nobody was a Christian, where nobody followed Christ. In South India still today, there are the Martoma Christians who claim to have their origins with the witness of the Apostle Thomas in India. So when, you, when you're a loner and you have the courage sometimes to carry that gospel alone when there's nobody to support it and encourage you, God can use you in a mighty way. And when you are a skeptic, guess what? Sometimes you're just a little better at connecting with skeptics than the people who had an easier time with believing. You've been in their shoes. You, you can empathize. You can work with them. Some of the greatest um, witnesses of the Christian faith have been some of the um, hardest skeptics. Thomas went to India. Thomas there, according to church history, was eventually killed by enemies of the gospel. So let me just um, say this. If you spend a lot of time smirking at Doubting Thomas and say, yeah, an old puddle glum and Eeyore, and he had to have this and that just to convince him to believe, let me just ask you, what have you done for the Lord lately? <laughs> you know, did you go off to a land thousands of miles away by yourself and eventually get killed for the sake of the gospel? Uh, that's trusting Thomas. So. We can learn from doubting Thomas, but don't forget what Jesus turned him into. You never know what Jesus can turn you into, but he can take the raw materials that may have seemed to make it hard to come to faith and use those very raw materials to make you a mighty person of faith. It seems that God likes challenges. When God looked around at the early church, who did he decide now? Who is going to be my absolute greatest and most effective missionary of all? Let's see, should it be Peter? You know, that foremost spokesman of the disciples? Or maybe John, 
that beloved disciple or, you know, any of the others, they're all going to be great missionaries. I'm sending them all. Who do I want to be the top missionary of them all? Hey, I got an idea. My worst enemy on the whole planet. I think I'll pick him and make him my greatest missionary of all. So Saul of Tarsus, who presides over the murder of the first Christian martyr Stephen and is going around killing and imprisoning others and is on the war path to wipe out the Christian faith, he's the one that the risen Jesus comes to in his glory and blinds him and gives him a revelation of himself and all that Paul can do is say, Lord, what will you have me to do? And Jesus says, well, I'm sending you to turn people from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. So that's how Jesus operates. He looks at the worst guy, his harshest enemy, and says, okay, I'm going to make Saul into Paul, the great missionary. I'm going to take Thomas and turn the skeptic into a missionary to India. I'm going to take the butcher of Christians and make him into the missionary who writes half the New Testament. You just never know what God might choose to do. Here's a quote for you. I believe in no religion. There is absolutely no proof for any of them. And from a philosophical standpoint, Christianity is not even the best. All religions are merely man's inventions. Stated by an elite professor at an elite university. And you say, boy, those are the kind of guys we need a lot less of, these new atheists, these people that are always um, attacking the Christian faith and saying there's nothing to it at all. There's no proof. It's not even the best of the religions that are out there, and all of them are invented by man. Well, that professor said, I felt the steady, unrelenting approach of him whom I so earnestly desired not to meet. That which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. I gave in and admitted that God was God and knelt and prayed, perhaps the most dejected and reluctant convert in all England. That was the atheist professor, and he had reasons. He grew up. In a family, his mother died when he was nine years old. He was then sent off to a terrible boarding school um, ruled by a harsh and weird um, headmaster who was a few years later declared to be insane. Then, after having his mother die, living in that kind of a boarding school, he was sent off in his late teens to the trenches of World War I, where his best friend was blown up and he was injured, and then he came back home and became a great and brilliant professor and said, there is no God, there is no evidence, there is no proof. It, it wasn't just his brain that analyzed things. His life had been a very difficult life, and yet, and yet, the living God approached him, and he couldn't. He couldn't avoid him anymore. And he's the guy who wrote about Puddle Glum and a whole bunch of other stuff that millions of kids still read today. The greatest Christian author of the 20th century was one of the most hard-nosed skeptics and one of the most wounded people um, against God in many ways who became a mighty ambassador for God. So uh, I, I'll just issue a warning if somebody's here today or, or you know somebody who, who thinks that they're a big-time skeptic or even an enemy of God like the Apostle Paul was, or there's no way I'm never going to believe in a gazillion years. Uh, yeah, right. Um, <laughs> maybe. We'll see about that. Well, here's a story from the Old Testament of a scared skeptic. Gideon was a man who was basically hiding in caves along with the rest of the Israelites in an occupied country. And they were under the crushing hand of the Midianites, and things were very hard for them. And Gideon was frightened. Well, the angel of the Lord, which is the form that Jesus would take before he came to earth as Jesus, the angel of the Lord comes to him and says, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Gideon replied, But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders? So this claim, the Lord is with you, he says, Yeah, right. Uh, why all this? And mighty warrior, are you joking? How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest 
and I'm the least in my family. Okay, I'm part of a nation that is under a foreign occupier. Our nation is wimpy. My clan is the wimpiest in the nation, and I'm the wimpiest in the clan. And you're calling me mighty warrior. Let's get real here. Well, I want proof that it's really you, Lord, speaking to me. Give me a sign. So he brings um, a meal and puts it on a rock, and the angel Lord reaches out with his staff, and poof, the whole thing burns up. Whoa, that'll convince a guy, won't it? So Gideon looks out at all the Midianite troops and that, that fire that consumed the meal seems, you know, so two weeks ago. And he says, well, I need another sign. You know, I need some signs here. Now, what I want you to do is tomorrow morning I want the ground to be just as dry as it can be, but I want this fleece to be soaking wet. And if it's soaking wet, then I'll know that you're really speaking to me and you're really going to empower me to do this. So he gets up and the ground is dry as a bone and he wrings a bowl full of water out of that fleece. Now he knows for sure. Oopsie daisy, allow me one more test. Could you do that one in reverse? Um, tomorrow morning when I get up, could you make the ground really, really wet but have the fleece be bone dry? So he gets up the next morning, the fleece is dry, the ground is wet. Now he's ready and raring to go. He looks at the armies again and he gets together uh, and calls together an army of his own. He's got 32,000 men, not enough. You know, there's hundreds of thousands for the other guys, but 32,000 at least is a beginning. And the Lord says, too many, too many. And so Gideon says, okay, everybody who's a little bit scared, go home. 10,000 left. That's pretty depressing. 10,000 to go against, uh, you know, way, way more people in the Midianite forces. The Lord looks at the 10,000. Gideon thinks that's not enough. God says, way too many. So he sends them down to get a drink. And he says, now Gideon, here's what I want you to do. Everybody who stoops down and just drinks out of the water, send them home too. And the people who slurp out of their hands, um, those are the ones that I'm going to use. 300 are left. Well, you know, you've had that fire poof out of the rock. You've, you've had the, the fleece wet and the ground dry and then the ground dry and the fleece wet. But when you've got 300 um, against uh, more than 100,000, you've got a problem. So God says to Gideon, now, if you're afraid to attack, go down to the camp. And so he sneaks into the Midianite camp at night and he hears a conversation and the guy, one of the guys has had a dream that a loaf of bread, and a loaf of bread sounds kind of like the name for Gideon, comes in and knocks down a tent. And the other guy says, oh, no, I know what that means. It means that Gideon is going to come and destroy us. So Gideon says, I, I, I think that might be a sign. <laughs> so he heads out, and he and his 300 men surround the camp. They have a clever plan. They smash their pots and raise up their torches and blow their trumpets and the the, the enemy thinks they're surrounded and they all get in a panic in the dark and they all start fighting each other and before you know it, they're all on the run and they're wiped out and Gideon has won a great triumph. And when you read Hebrews 11, the, the hall of fame of people of faith, one name among the heroes of faith is Gideon, that mighty hero of faith who needed at least four signs um, to persuade him that God was talking to him and that God was going to work through him. So again, uh, when we look at the heroes of faith, it's really not so much their mighty faith or their great wisdom or their great strength, but it is encouraging that when you've got a Gideon out there who thinks he's the wimpiest of the whole nation, God can make him into a mighty warrior by saying mighty warrior. We got to understand the power of God. Because we have our notions about what's true and what's not. And God said mighty warrior. Gideon said wimp. Who turned out to be right? Well, I, I think they were both right. I, I think Gideon was kind of a wimp. But the Bible says God calls things that are not as though they are. And once he speaks it, it becomes true even if it wasn't before. Gideon was a wimp. Of unbelief, God called him a mighty warrior, and that's what he was, because God called him that. 
When God speaks, what he says happens. Take it to the bank. And so when he comes to Thomas, he knows Thomas' objections. He knows all those doubts. He knows Thomas said, unless I see, unless I touch, I'll never believe. And Jesus comes to him and elicits from Thomas the greatest confession of faith, my Lord and my God. Are you able to say that? We've been talking maybe a little too much about Thomas and Paul and Gideon and C.S. Lewis. I only talk about them because I'm talking about Jesus. These are people who were nothing. These were people who were worse than nothing. Some of them were enemies. And God came to them. The risen Christ came to them and he made them what they became. And we want to think about trusting Thomas because of the one he called my Lord and my God. Jesus is your Lord and your God. Do you believe in him? Not just that he did something once upon a time, but that he is now Lord and God. If you're a doubter, I hope you're encouraged that someone with the classic profile of a doubter, someone who was a a pessimist, a questioner, a loner, a skeptic, was loved by Jesus and used in a mighty way by Jesus. If that's your personality type, be encouraged. Because on this Easter, Christ can come to you and he can make you mighty for him. But maybe you're not like that. Maybe you're kind of an easy believer. Maybe you say, yeah, it's Easter. Yeah, Jesus is risen. Woohoo! Feeling mighty fine about that. But you might want to take a page or two from Thomas anyway. Because a good many people believe in Jesus' resurrection sort of the way they believe that Mercury is the first planet from the sun. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Now on with life. <laughs> you know, knowing which planet is the first from the sun might help you get one question right in your science studies, but it, it hasn't made a huge impact on your life, has it, that Mercury is the first planet from the sun? Or you might even be, let's say you're a fan of track and field or the Olympics, and you say, Usain Bolt, he is the fastest man who ever lived. Not only do I know that as a fact, but I've watched him run, and I found it very exciting. Very exciting indeed. And do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Kind of the way you believe that Usain Bolt could run faster than anybody else. That was quite a feat that he accomplished. Now, back to our usual um, way of life. So if you're an easy believer and you kind of believe this fact, uh, this truth about Jesus, but he's not your Lord and your God, then there's a lot to learn from trusting Thomas. My Lord. You're going to run my life. You said as the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. You are called and sent by Jesus. My God. Thomas didn't just believe. He adored. He worshipped. Easter is about worship and adoration of Jesus and of God the Father and the Holy Spirit. Easter is about worship and then obedience and having a purpose and a calling and being sent out by him. Thomas to India, to his death. I don't know what the individual calling for each of you is, but be in prayer about that. Maybe you already know it. Then follow it. Don't put it off. Don't just be an easy believer. And then finally, I want to remind you of the blessings of believing without seeing. John says, the whole point of my book is so that you'll believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, that by believing you'll have life in His name. And that's, that's the baseline, that's the foundation. If you don't have that faith and that life in His name, then don't let another day go by without receiving by faith the salvation of the living Lord Jesus Christ. He died to pay for your sins. He rose to give you eternal life. And you receive that by believing in His name. That's how you get life. So, If you're a doubter, doubt your doubts. Trust Jesus. If you're into easy belief, well, go beyond mere belief. Adore him. Love him. Serve him. Dare something great for him. Triumph by his power. And then hear his words to Thomas and embrace the blessing of believing even when you can't see. He said, Thomas, now, do you believe because you've seen me? Well, blessed are those who haven't seen and yet believe. You know what that means? That means that you and I 
There's one sense in which we are more blessed than Thomas. Because Thomas saw and believed. John went into the tomb and saw the empty tomb and saw those cloths lying there folded and empty and he believed. You and I haven't seen with our eyes or touched in that manner. But when we believe, Jesus says, we are even more blessed than those who were there to actually see it. As the Bible says elsewhere, though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That is the glad news of Easter, friends. When you embrace him by faith, he gives you eternal life and nothing can take that life away. Jesus has triumphed and because he has triumphed, so do we. We thank you, Lord, for your great victory over death. And we thank you, too, for your victory over all our hesitations and our unbelief, our doubts and our questionings. We thank you, Lord, that you can use people of every kind to be your ambassadors. And so we pray again today that through encounter with the living Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may have a strong and living faith that we can say praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And may, Lord, we live in that joy, that power of the resurrection hope. And we pray, Lord, that where people still struggle with just the quirks of their own personality, with the questions and doubts that they've been through, with the traumas that have made it hard for them to believe good things about you and your care for them, we pray that whatever it is, Lord, that would hold us back from faith, just make yourself known so that by your grace we may be people of faith and we can confess, my Lord and my God. Amen.